Thank you very much, Ashley and CIP, for having us. Um, before we get started, in your folder behind, on the left-hand side, there's a information sheet. And if you wouldn't mind uh, taking yes, it up, that one right there. And there should have been a pen with it. So um, no, we took the pens off. Huh. If you need a pen, let me know. I'll get you a pen. But um, if you don't mind filling that out, I'd appreciate it, just so um, we can continue giving you information, because um, we're going to give you a lot here tonight, and we don't want you to feel like if you don't catch everything, you're stuck. Outside of school as well. Um, and I never really developed a love of learning, a love of school. Um, homework was always a real fight between my mom and I. Um, I would do the bare minimum to get by, but I never did it because I was interested in whatever I was learning. Um, so fast forward a few years to um, college. I went off to a traditional four year university that had great learning support um, and would have been suitable for me, outside of the fact that my executive functioning skills were abysmal. So the, the pattern that emerged uh, was that I'd start off really strong, and a lot of you are probably going to really connect to this. Every semester was going to be a better semester than the last, or every year. And when the workload would increase, my output would de decrease, I'd become anxious, I'd isolate myself, and avoid teachers, avoid classes, avoid um, any support staff that could actually help me work through it because I didn't know how to access it and the anxiety was too much. So before I knew it, I had failed out of two colleges. I was 19 years old, living in my parents' basement, playing video games, dreaming of the idea that I could be a professional video game player. Um, still don't know if that's a thing. So finally, at the age of 21, I was diagnosed with ADHD. So after I got the diagnosis, it was a fantastic, fantastic thing to learn because there was finally a reason as to why I was struggling. Um, so I finally got the help I needed in college and got an executive functioning coach who taught me skills and tools I needed to be successful. And I finally learned that education and learning was a fantastic thing and I had a passion for it. Um, so as you can see, I graduated with a BA in psychology. And after working elsewhere, I decided it was time for a change, and that's when I, I joined my mom, Jill. Uh, but the reason I share this isn't to, to hog the stage, it's to tell you, you know, we understand, she definitely understands what it's like to raise a pain like myself, who knew what he needed to do, but just wasn't performing, you know, wasn't connecting those pieces together. And for myself, I understand students really well. Um, and we understand the importance of getting it right. So now Jill's going to tell you about one of our students, give you an idea of some of the students we work with. Okay, so after hearing Jordan's story, you can imagine how incredibly proud I was and his father when he finally graduated college. And in the work we do, every day we get to work with kids and we're trying to find that um, that placement form where they're going to be successful and happy. Um, that's really, really important. So we're going to talk a little bit about, sorry, can you hear me when I turn? Anyway, we're going to talk about Brian. Um, Brian was, came to us young. Uh, he was in eighth grade. 
He had been at an LD school all elementary and middle school years, and he was now transitioning to his local public high school. He was very shy. He was very short, very huggable, really sweet kid. Didn't have very many advocacy skills. Um, he was really, really smart, but he, he still didn't have all the tools in his toolboxes that he needed. Um, so he lacked confidence. Um, like I said, he's the kind of kid like every mother would want, and you just want to take him in your arms. So his end goal was to end up at a four-year university. Um, and you can see up there that he, he's now college-bound. He's going to be attending Syracuse University. And he received $100,000 in merit money from a lot of different schools. So Jordan's going to switch the slide. I'm going to tell you how we got him there. Got it, Jordan? Yep. So when he first came to us in eighth grade, um, we wanted to pick <coughs> his courses for high school where he was going to be successful. We didn't want him overwhelmed. It's a really big transition for kids, and especially a young man coming out of uh, an all, a school just for kids with learning disabilities. So we decided we'd start him out with four classes instead of uh, the traditional five. And because he had auditory processing issues, we decided to leave language out. Um, you don't need four years of language to attend a college, so we didn't feel like we were compromising his college process whatsoever. Um, we made sure as he went through he, had, he was being successful, he had the appropriate tutors, we made sure he was in the level classes that he needed to be to be successful. Sophomore year we did the same thing. The beginning of junior year we started looking at colleges more seriously. We made sure he has accommodations for the ACT, we made sure his psychoeducational testing was updated and would be current when he went to college, and then we sat down and had a really long talk about what he wanted. He wanted special education. He wanted a mid-sized school. He didn't care what state he was in. Um, his confidence had grown exponentially, uh, as, long, as, long, as well as his size. You know, He was now towering over me. Um, and he had a good sense of who he was because of all the successes he had had in high school. So he visited colleges with his parents to get a good sense of really what he wanted. You've got to be on campus or in a program like Save, you've got to visit. Um, so we had a pretty good idea. By the summer before his senior year, we started working on his college essays. Um, we find that a great time to do it because by the time school starts, the kids are already done. And it's really the only hard thing that they have to do with the application process. We also worked on applications. By mid-November, um, Brian, Brian was done with all his work. We had submitted his test scores. And we're not saying this, we don't like to brush kids through. We want them First of all, we try and get them an acceptance right away because so many of the kids we see, and I can tell you Jordan was exactly the same, don't really believe they're going to get in any colleges. Um, so it also freed him up to do other things senior year and not be bogged down in the college process. We submitted all appropriate, uh, appropriate sorry, documentation, the stress to reduce, and this fall he's going to be attending Syracuse University, as I said, as a special education major. I get goosebumps when I talk about him. And Jordan's going to talk about our next young man, Peter. And all these names are going to change. We take confidentiality very, very seriously. seriously. Um, so Peter is, uh, came to us at a different time and has different struggles. So trying to give you a, a broad understanding of the students we work with. Um, so Peter's on the autism spectrum. and. Uh, was an actual rock star academically. He never ran into a course in high school or before that, that he found problematic. Um, he was taking APs and honor courses, uh, got a 33 on the ACT, um, but he had struggles in the social world and with independent living skills and executive functioning skills were a struggle for him. But he really wanted an engineering program, and a rigorous one, and he would be able to do that, and it was important for him to know that that was his end goal. But as we continued to work with him and, and speak with some of his resources, we found that there was some pieces of his puzzle that were missing to get that end goal of getting a degree in engineering. Um, so, we... Um, 
So we started with Peter as a junior. So when we first started, we met with him and his family. We assessed, you know, what he wanted and what he needed in a program. And we also spoke with his case manager at his high school. We spoke with his psychologist because we had just met him at the time and they have been working with him for, for much longer. So we wanted to get a better understanding of, of what he may need uh, moving forward. And through those conversations, we learned that he was not ready to live in a dorm, that that piece was going to be really problematic and he needed to learn those skills in order to be successful. So we started looking at programs very similar uh, to CIP for him, and he finally understood, it took him some time to understand, you know, while it wasn't a linear path, he was going to get to where he wanted to be, but he needed to learn these skills first. So as, as we went through the, the application process, both Jill and I worked on on essay developments and, and deadlines uh, with him. Um, his family and, and every family that we work with were, were really stressed out by the process. So after every session, we email our families, um, let them know what part of the process they're in, what we got done that day, so that everyone's on the same page and understands what's going on. Um, so Peter ended up going to a program very similar to CIP where he had his first girlfriend. He had people to eat meals with. He was having social activities. He was having fun while taking some college classes. But he was also gaining social pragmatic skills and, and independent living skills. Really, life skills, learning how to live as independently as possible. There was no question that he was going to be totally fine academically in college. But these pieces were very important for him. So he stayed there for a year and a half and is now um, headed to University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, where he's going to be an engineering student living in the dorms. Um, and he feels confident and ready to do those things. And he understands what he'll need and where to access those things, which is really important. Um, so I know I have ADHD, and we talked a little bit about that. but. I'm an executive functioning coach, and it still makes me smile because it took me a long time to gather, gather those skills, let alone be able to teach someone else. Um, so the areas that we focus on are planning, prioritizing. I'm not going to go through those. They're pretty self-explanatory. But how do I coach? I meet with students once or twice a week, depending on the family. and. I help kids reach their goals and help them realize what their goals are. And I do that by asking a lot of questions, being realistic with students, and then helping them get there by teaching them tools, skills, whether it's an application on the phone or you know, sleep hygiene, you know, there's a million things. And teaching them the options to use in order to be successful, rather than saying, so you have um, trouble's going to sleep, let's do this, and this is your only option. That doesn't really work with teenagers, I find. It wouldn't have worked with me. They need options, so they can decide what's going to work for them. And then it becomes their process, and you're just guiding them along, um, so that they can internalize it, um, which is really important. Once they find the right skills, it's all about practice. It's all about building a routine, finding what works, and sustaining. Um, sustaining those skills and accessing those skills. Um, and I find it really beneficial because the kids own the process. This is not, you know, some 34-year-old guy telling them this is what you have to do. This is their process. I'm just telling them what's available to them, uh, which I find important. So now, Jill's going to tell you a little bit about our process and how we work with families. So, well, my page says one thing anyway. Sorry, how we can help. We visit colleges every year in post secondary programs. We see between 20 and 30 programs in colleges a year. We have to lay feet on the college to find out who's a good match in, in multiple of different areas. Um, we're extremely hands-on in our application program process. Some of our kids will 
take the ball and run with it, and we'll say, okay, go home and fill this out, and they will. But most of our kids don't feel confident enough to do that, so we, we work with them one-on-one, -on -one, and we will sit with them while they fill out all the blanks on every application. Uh, they may not feel confident about their spelling, or about missing things, or about knowing where they were born. Um, we do one-on-one -on -one interviews with disability support offices at every college and post-secondary program. There is not one size fits all for these kids. Some schools do a much better job uh, with academic tutoring, like reading and science, and some uh, do a better job, say, with executive functioning. So you, we, you have to know, really, you have to know where your student's going to need help and who's going to best be able to, um, to give them that help, okay? Because there's a wide variety of programs out there. Um, we customize our process for each student. We do a detailed interview, intake process. We read all documentation. Um, it's often we can read 50 pages of documentation, but it, get, it gives us good insight into who the kids are and how they learn. Like we've talked about, we call psychologists, tutors, anyone who can give us input from, from the students. We look at five key areas to create a successful college or post-secondary match. The first one is academics. You know, is a student, do they have any idea what they want to study? If they do, great. We're going to give them, we're going to give them the opportunity to study that and also make sure they have options in case they change their mind. Most of our kids have no idea what they want to study, so we can give them a range of programs and, and they, you know, they'll be absolutely fine. Some of our kids get a lot of their self-esteem from extracurriculars. So one year I had a kid and he, he was um, a black belt in karate. And it was really important for him to have a dojo to continue that because academics were not his thing until he got to college, so he needed to have um, the extracurricular that made him feel good about himself. Social life. Kids have to find their people. And even kids on the spectrum, if they haven't had friends, we feel it's really important for them to go places like CIP where they can learn to live in this world because most of them can get an education but learning to live in, in a socially confusing world for them is really, really important. Um, and they need people to do things with, whether it's you know have a meal or go to a movie. Uh, they're removed from their families, so they need that that social that social group to be with. Uh, learning support: Do they need executive functioning tutoring? Do they need dyslexic? Do they need reading help? And on down the list. And the last thing is independent living. And we look at this really carefully because, like Jordan was talking about Peter, who was a rock star academically, but wasn't one to get up and shower by himself. Um, when he got upset, he couldn't regulate his emotions. So those independent living skills are really, really important. We had a kid a couple years ago, and he didn't brush his teeth. Why? Because his Legos were all over his bathroom floor, and he couldn't get into the sink. Okay? So learning to solve those kinds of problems are really important. Um, so I think we are at the questions part. Jordan, I know you wanted to add something else about the, the sheets we handed out. Yeah, just being bossy. Um, so those sheets that you do have, does everyone have pens and, and one of those sheets? And don't feel like you absolutely have to, but we'd like to be able to continue to give, give you more information. So on the bottom of the sheet, are three options. If you have an interest in any of them, uh, please select one. We'll we'll be sure to provide that for you. So questions? Sure. How many years have you been consulting? I've been I've been doing it 17 years. I started the business because I was looking for colleges for Jordan, and I realized what a there were so many schools doing great things for kids with disabilities. Um, I was working at Roosevelt University tutoring kids before that, and Jordan's been doing it three and a half years. You're all so quiet. Go ahead and then a Where would you start for someone who, like your son, failed out of college, didn't really know what to do with themselves because they didn't understand why they had issues. Now they've been diagnosed with multiple things and just having a hard time getting started and getting that confidence back. Where do you start with something like, somebody like that? We start with the kids' strengths, okay? Kids are not identified, they're not defined by their disability. 
They all have really wonderful things about them. Okay, and so we, you know, just like with Jordan, you know, he wasn't like, you know, he wasn't a kid who failed out of college. He was a wonderful kid who had tons of strengths. And then it, it really depends on the kids. It's a difficult situation. I get it. Um, but we we work with, you know, we, we try and figure out where are the strengths. And then obviously we're we're our job is very much to listen and and to talk to kids about what they envision for themselves. Um, Brian, who, you know, he wanted special ed from the very beginning. Um, he really knew what he wanted, but lots of kids don't. And so then you have to help them figure out what's in their best interest. Did they answer it? And I think another piece, if your son is questioning if college is for him, um, speaking with a therapist or something like that would be uh, beneficial for him if he's open to it. Okay, great. Yeah, did you have a question? I did. Do you, are you able to provide your support um, in a distance kind of setting? Yeah. Because okay. I don't live in this area. Yeah, yeah, we've had lots of kids from out of state. We're very specialized, obviously. We don't take kids who are traditional learners. So we've, you know, now with Skype and FaceTime, it's it's easier to do than ever. Yeah, super. Nice. Yeah. Sure. Do you, ever, do you ever have situations where you have those conversations and consult and then go back to the parents and say, you know, your college isn't the right thing now? Yes. <laughs> so Peter came to us and was gung ho about college. And through talking and talking with the support team, and reading his documentation, it became clearer that it wasn't the right step first. Um, and we have very open and candid conversations about it. Um, there's nothing wrong with, you know, going this way instead of this way. Um, and that worked for Peter. It worked for myself. Um, I had a conversation, sorry, Jordan, um, a couple days ago. Mother called me and she said um, her daughter was going into like post second, like staying in high school another year or two. And then she said she's going to stay there for three years and then she's going to go to college. Okay? And I started asking questions. What kind of classes did she take? The young woman had taken all special ed classes. She had very, very low ACT scores. And it became very apparent to me that this was not a kid who was going to be college bound. We don't set kids up for failure. You know, we want them to be, we want them to be happy and successful. Um, and to put them in, even if they could get into college, you know, with lots of kids, there's no point. Let's get them in a vocational program, let's get them independent living skills, and let them move on that way. Very often, lots of times, the kids, when we say to them, look, you want to go to college, do you want to take more math? No, I don't want to take more math. Do you want to take more English? No. It's the idea that they're going somewhere. But we're very honest because we don't set kids up for failure.